we'll get, go ahead and get started because we have a full program that we are expecting some other people to join us. Welcome to the second of our four-part educational series, Virginia Preservation Academy. I'm Elizabeth Castelny, CEO of Preservation Virginia, and on behalf of our board and statewide staff, I thank you for joining to us tonight. I'd also like to thank the Department of Historic Resources for helping to organize and fund this series. We're indebted to our year-round partnership with the department to preserve the Commonwealth's history. Thanks also goes to our panel of experts for what promises to be an educational and engaging program. I especially wanna thank Sonia Ingram, Preservation Virginia's Associate Director of Preservation Field Services for envisioning this series as a way to explore the fundamentals of preservation best practices. The Virginia Preservation Academy features live lectures by preservation professionals with direct interaction between participants and panelists. Recordings of this webinar will serve as the foundation for a library of training videos and available on our website and also the Virginia Department of Historic Resources website at, um, in the coming days. You may also be interested to learn about another tool for Virginia's historic preservation community. The Virginia Historic Preservation Network is a web-based platform for questions and collaborations, for sharing information, ideas, and events about history and historic preservation across Virginia. The link to join the Preservation Network will be in the chat. We are grateful to the following sponsors who not only support this program, but also supported our advocacy during the General Assembly session. These sponsors include Rick Barker Properties, Monument Construction, Historic Richmond, Linden Capital, National Trust Insurance Services, Glave and Homes, Piedmont Environmental Council, Herschler, Commonwealth Preservation Group, and Jenny Keller and Trip Pollard. A few housekeeping um, bits before we begin. You may ask questions at any time um, by typing those questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our best to get to um, as many as possible at the end of the program. For best viewing options, I'd encourage you to go to the upper right corner and select speaker, uh, the speaker option. Um, that, that'll help with uh, eliminating distractions. Preservation Virginia as a certified certification maintenance provider by the American Institute of Certified Planners, AICP, um, is offering credits for this program and the next two in the series. Um, you can get those maintenance credits of 1.5 um, for each of the webinars and instructions for AICP members um, will be put in the chat so you can capture those credits. In 2020, 2021, David Brown, formerly the vice president at the National Trust, facilitated a process with Preservation Virginia's staff and board to revise our strategic plan and vision. With input and dialogue from stakeholders, allies, partners, and activists, we examined how the world was changing and how historic preservation could bring value, economic recovery, and connect communities across the Commonwealth. At the core of that plan are the principles of knowledge and innovation, integrity, inclusion and diversity, and sustainable stewardship. All of these to make a difference in Virginia and to get things done. The, preservation, the Virginia Preservation Academy is one example of how Preservation Virginia seeks to expand networks and support local capacity building to sustain Virginia's historic places. The series will continue on March 30th with a program that focuses on how to research a historic property and tips for preparing national and state historic register nominations. And on April 6th, we'll have a session on how to choose a preservation consultant, how to hire them, how to, how to uh, find them. In future years, 
Webinars will include workshops on rehabilitation, tax, historic tax credits, environmental review, grant writing, historic cemeteries, revolving funds, and a host of other topics. We also plan to have an introductory workshops on historic architecture, archeology, span historic building restoration, and training modules for architectural review board members. However, these programs will only be a success if uh, with your participation and input. So let us know the topics that are important to you. Um, so at, at, as we create the new uh, set of series. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Genevieve Keller. Many of you know Jenny from her outstanding work in the historic preservation and cultural landscape practice and theory. As the co-founder with J. Timothy Keller, F-A-S-L-A, -A, um, of the award-winning firm, Land and Community Associates. Jenny um, has been working with World Heritage Sites, National Parks, National Historic Landmarks, and National Register Districts. Um, as a team, they have raised awareness and protection for significant cultural landscapes and encouraged uh, that there are advantages of a cross-disciplinary planning and preservation approaches. As a founding member of the Preservation Alliance of Virginia, Jenny was instrumental in encouraging the merger of missions of Preservation Alliance and APVA in the early 2000s and offering her leadership as we realized those goals. And for the past two years, Jenny has served as the board chair for Preservation Virginia. Her steady hand and visionary leadership have been instrumental as we navigated this period of change and uncertainty. Jenny? Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Sonia, for your excellent planning of this series. I'm very pleased today to moderate this session because of the importance of the National Register of Historic Places as foundational in American historic preservation. It is and has been since 1966 at the core of our national preservation theory, methodologies, and practices. Determinations about what places are significant occur primarily because we have a national register with flexible criteria that can be interpreted at national, state, and local levels of significance. All state, tribal, and federal preservation offices use the National Register as the basis for their programs. The very popular Historic Tax Credit Certification Program, for example, that is so well known and widely used throughout the nation and especially in Virginia, relies upon the National Register. And many local jurisdictions, cities, towns, and counties set up their own districts. And they also often adopt the National Register uh, to inform di their criteria. And increasingly in my work, I see the National Register nomination as a legal document because National Register nominations might be scrutinized and even used in courts of law when preservation cases are litigated. And so in this session, we hope to take some of the mystery out of the National Register by learning from dedicated and credentialed professionals who know and rely upon the National Register each and every day in their professional lives. We have a faculty for this session of three very dedicated preservation professionals whose work and decision making have intersected with state and national registers in many ways. I'm going to introduce them all at once and then they will follow in sequence. Our first presenter is Dr. Elizabeth Moore, state archaeologist for the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. She will speak on the history of registers, the differences between the national and state registers, the benefits of listing, what are thematic nominations and multiple property nominations, sort of the ins and outs of all of this. Dr. Moore has worked in archaeology and preservation for more than 35 years. She received a BA from SUNY Potsdam and her MA and PhD from the American University. She's worked for several firms in the private sector conducting cultural resource management studies in the Middle Atlantic region as the program manager for the archaeobiology program at the National Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian Institution and as curator of archaeology at the Virginia Museum of Natural History. She joined the Department of Historic Resources in 2019 as state archaeologist. 
She served on the State Review Board as well as many other boards that deal with archeology, span history and preservation. Her own research specialty is identifying and interpreting food remains from the past to help us understand how people accessed and managed food resources and how food is used in social and symbolic expression. From there, we will move to our second presentation that deals with the process and criteria of state and national listing. And for that, we have uh, the services of historic architect Jody Lahendro, FAIA, who recently retired following nearly 17 years as historic preservation architect at the University of Virginia. In retirement, Jody is now providing pro bono services to nonprofits with historic buildings associated with African American history. He received his Bachelor of Architecture from Virginia Tech and a Master in Architectural History from UVA. Jody has served on and chaired the Virginia State Review Board and also has broad local experience from serving on a number of boards, including uh, boards of architectural review and a planning commission. And our third presentation tonight will address a very timely topic of equity and inclusion in state and national register listings. And we're very pleased to have Jeffrey Free Harris, who is a Hampton based historian and historic preservation consultant, who also currently serves on the Virginia Board of Historic Resources and chairs the National Rainbow Heritage Network that advocates for LGBTQ historic places. As the National Trust for Historic Preservation's first director for diversity, Jeffrey worked with preservation organizations and historic sites around the country on issues related to diversity in the preservation movement. And currently Jeffrey is researching and documenting music related historic sites across the country as a way to engage music lovers in preservation advocacy. At the conclusion of these three presentations, we will have ample time for questions and answers, but now we will turn to our first presenter, Dr. Moore. Thank you very much, Jenny. I'm going to switch now from my video to the presentation. And you can see that, is that correct? Is that shared? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, and it's good to be with you this evening. So tonight I'm going to be talking about DHR's register program, which manages the Virginia Landmarks Register and the National Register of Historic Places in the Commonwealth. I'll also be discussing some of the benefits of register listing and thematic listings in multiple property documents. So the Department of Historic Resources, or DHR, is the State Historic Preservation Office in Virginia. The State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO, plays a critical role in carrying out many responsibilities in historic preservation, surveying, evaluating, and nominating significant historic buildings, sites, structures, districts, and objects for the National Register is just one of those key activities. Director Julie Langan serves as a Virginia SHPO, and our mission at DHR is to foster, encourage, and support the stewardship of Virginia's significant historic, architectural, and cultural resources, and managing the registers is a big part of that mission. So DHR's register program administers um, two major programs, the Virginia Landmarks Register and the National Register of Historic Places, the latter on behalf of the National Park Service. The registers offer honorary designation of the Commonwealth significant districts, battlefields, archeological sites, buildings, and other types of historic properties. The honorary designation of the register listing both provides permanent documentation of irreplaceable historic resources and encourages their continued preservation. The two registers serve as official lists of historic properties. They are, again, they are honorary designations, and as such, they offer no protections to a property. Protection and preservation is dependent on the homeowner or property owner. There are no restrictions placed on a property when they are listed, uh, which is a question we often get here at DHR, because um, there's a confusion between local ordinances and register listing often, but listing on the register actually carries no restrictions or protections with it. Some localities have local ordinances, um, but again, those are not part of the register program. Finally, the registers are rooted in academic scholarship. The research done to nominate a property is critical and it must be accurate and well-documented. The National Park Service oversees two federal designation programs that DHR manages at the state level. These are the National Register of Historic Places and the National Historic Landmarks Program. The National Historic Landmarks Program was established in 1960 
And the first National Historic Landmarks designated in Virginia that year include uh, kind of the, the top list of well-known properties in Virginia, things such as the Virginia State Capitol, Fort Monroe, Mount Vernon, Monticello, Bacon's Castle, the Williamsburg Historic District, and Lee Chapel. The National Register of Historic Places was authorized by the National Historic Preservation Act several years later in 1966, and it establishes a program to identify America's historic above ground and archeological resources. The first group of National Register nominations listed included all of the NHLs that had been in that first list, plus additional properties like the UVA Rotunda, Alexandria Historic District, Woodrow Wilson Birthplace, St. John's Episcopal Church, and many, many others. The first and only submerged site listed in Virginia is the site of the Yorktown Shipwrecks listed in 1973. And I did a quick search of National Register underwater listings, and I think this was actually the first underwater site listed nationwide. Um, I couldn't find any others earlier, but I'm sure somebody will uh, send me a message if I got it wrong. Uh, the first archaeological site listed in Virginia was the Jamestown National Historic Site in 1966. And the Thunderbird Archaeological District was the first archaeological district listed in 1977. And that's on both the National Register and is a National Historic Landmark. So the register program in Virginia is robust with 3,141 listings as of this week. We do have a state review board meeting tomorrow, so there will be more nominations moving forward uh, later this week. The most nominations are written by property owners or professional consultants, and these nominations are assisted and reviewed by DHR staff, and then reviewed by the State Review Board, which makes recommendations for listing to Director Langan. Virginia has 123 National Historic Landmarks, coming in fourth in the nation. We'd like to be first, but we can't always be. Um, we're only behind Pennsylvania with 169, Massachusetts with 191, and New York with 275. I was out at where Wacomico National Park today, and they're actually going to be moving forward with an application for National Historic Landmark status. So we may have another one within a couple of years. So both registers have criteria which must be met in order to be listed. Uh, Jody will be covering these in much greater detail. But in brief, a property must have achieved its significance at least 50 years ago. It must be either associated with an important event or, or historic trend, be associated with an historic person, represent an important architectural or engineering design, or for archaeological sites, it must maintain research potential in the ground. Finally, the property must retain physical integrity in the form of intact historic materials, appearance, design, et cetera. And there's a lot more. Uh, factors which play into that that Jody will probably uh, talk about in just a moment. So there are some potential economic benefits of listing a property on either the state or national registers. Property owners may be able to donate an easement to the state. This donation may lower your tax burden, it can lessen inheritance taxes, and it preserves property in perpetuity. There may be state and federal tax credits available to property owners. And if you're interested in these, I recommend you contact one of our staff in the Preservation Incentives Division for more information um, and, and more on the process. And I recommend that you start that process early because there are things that you can do that um, can make the property difficult if you don't start out with uh, being fully informed ahead of time. There are also many community benefits to register listing, especially when a community has historic districts. These districts and the economic benefits that they provide can lead to community revitalization, economic development, and particularly significant in Virginia, heritage tourism. Communities have a great deal of local pride in their historic properties and often incorporate them into local festivals, events, and educational programs. When a property is placed on either register, you can be read recognized for that designation. You are entitled to place a plaque on your property. Um, owners are proud of these plaques. They are a public statement that this property holds a significant place in American history and that their owners are committed to the preservation and stewardship of those properties. Being listed means that this property is permanently documented and that research is available for future generations. And finally, this information on these properties is shared through DHR's educational efforts, whether in print or online. So there are 
two types of theme studies that can be used to assist with National Register or National Historic Landmark nominations. The first of these is called a multiple, multiple property document or an MPD. An MPD is not a nomination. It does not result in any property being listed on the National Register. Instead, an MPD provides the framework, the historic context, and the supporting research to establish a theme that ties together properties that have some aspect of history in common. States identify topics and develop multiple property documents. While some of these may have relevance in many states, many MPDs pertain to historic themes or patterns only within a state or even a locality. There are 48 multiple property documents in Virginia that include such varied topics as African-American heritage resources of Alexandria, Rosenwald schools, slave trade as commercial enterprise in Richmond, streamlined modern houses in Arlington County, and Virginia Beach oceanfront resort and motels and hotels. Um, so you can see some of these are very local, but some of them are statewide. Um, and it, again, if you have a property that falls under one of these themes, it makes it much easier to write your nomination um, and prepare all of the documentation you need to be placed on the National Register because a lot, of, a lot of that background research has been done for you already. One multiple property document currently in development is the African American Waterman Project. DHR is partnering with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the National Park Service, and the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership to document African-American waterman culture in Virginia's coastal communities. Again, MPDs do not nominate any of these properties, but they will make it easier um, to fit your property into one of these topics, depending on, on the type of property that you own. The National Historic Landmark Program does not have MPDs. Instead, the National Park Service develops what they call theme studies. They function in a similar fashion in that they identify a specific topic of American history that can be used to identify properties around that topic or theme, but they are relevant at a national level, not at a state or local level. Some recent theme studies for NHLs include LGBTQ America, American Latino Heritage, the era of reconstruction and Asian American Pacific Islanders. The most recently published NHL theme study is Civil Rights in America, Racial Discrimination in Housing, published in 2021. In 1999, the US Congress directed the National Park Service to conduct a multi-state study of civil rights sites to determine their national significance. As a result of that work, a framework was developed that recommended that a theme study be prepared to identify sites related to desegregation of schools, public accommodations, voting rights, housing, and equal employment. This most recent theme is the fourth part of the civil rights series to be released, and there are more to come. There are several ways of being listed on the two registers. You may have a single property of historic significance. You may have a contributing property in a historic district where together the properties tell a broader story than can be done by just one resource. You may have an archeological site that has stories yet to be discovered. All of these represent a commitment to preservation and stewardship, and we appreciate all of the property owners who participate in these programs. And if you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to take those. I don't know if we're doing those one at a time or all at the end, I suspect probably all at the end. Um, but I'm now going to pass the presenter torch onto Jody Lahendro, who will be discussing nominations to the registers in a great deal of detail, I'm sure. Thank you. Jody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let me pull up my screen. And go back to the beginning. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. I'm going to do, be discussing the process for listing uh, on the National Register and the Virginia Landmarks uh, Register. And first off, ah, here it is. Uh, why do it? Um, and actually, I don't see any reason to go through this because Elizabeth just uh, wonderfully covered this. Um, so I will leave it. Uh, I, I will just say, though, because it's so uh, important to me, first and foremost, by adding a property on the National Register, 
we are participating in the documentation of our national history. Um, buildings, the built environment, are art artifacts that open doors to understanding the many facets of our national history and culture. So it's it's really important uh, to to put these resources uh, on the National Register to document them and have them available for the future. Uh, the basics, um, the application process for both the register and the his, uh, national register are the same. Um, and they use the same nomination form uh, for both of these listings. There is DHR staff will be there every step of the way to assist with both listings and they do this without any uh, charge. And you must remember that DHR is your friend through this process, because believe me, you're gonna need uh, friends. Um, the, this is a graph from DHR that shows the 16 different steps to go from beginning to end uh, with a property listed on the National Register. Um, this is intimidating enough uh, on its own, uh, these 16 different tasks, difficult tasks. But when one realizes that uh, the process depends on the reviews and approvals of state and federal bureaucrats, um, you sometimes wonder if it's going to be worth it. Um, but I can assure you that it will be. And, and I'll give you a reason shortly. Uh, here, if you look closer at those 16 steps, you'll see that actually there are two different application processes. The preliminary information form on the left-hand side is handled solely by the Department of Historic Resources. The National Register for Historic Places nomination form on the right side, those steps, they're started but with the DHR and mostly handled by DHR. At the end, the National Park Service will come in and uh, review the application. Um, but this is where it starts. And it starts with your friends at DHR. There are three different regions uh, in Virginia that have been uh, created uh, and staff contact uh, people for each reason. You see here the three uh, for the regions they represent. Um, and with these people, you, so for, for where your property is in Virginia, you first contact the regional representative um, for that area. And that person will start to guide you through the process. Um, and that uh, you'll be first directed towards creating a preliminary information form. This uh, preliminary information form is a simple, I think I've, yeah, there it is. Okay, here's the um, DHR website for uh, finding information about the preliminary inf evaluation and nomination processes and the, the National Register process. This is an excellent website. Um, it, it takes you step by step through the process. It provides examples um, and it provides then links to the resources you'll need to the forms and to uh, guidelines, uh, document, uh, documents that will help you both from the, from the Park Service and from the uh, Department of Historic Resources. Um, the preliminary information form is where one normally starts. It's a simple process. It allows DHR the opportunity to evaluate your property and advise you on its chances for listing. Um, and on this website, I really highly encourage you to uh, take a look at the video that's linked here in the circle. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful video. It's not long. Uh, Elizabeth Lippert does a, a fantastic job in, in presenting this. So this is a, an example of a preliminary information form. I hope it demonstrates that it's really a very simple form to fill out. Uh, applicants to do this without uh, professional help. 
um, it requires mostly three different uh, types of narrative responses. Uh, under physical aspects, this is a narrative describing the, uh, the site uh, that the uh, resource is on. Uh, then uh, an architectural description is uh, required. Uh, and this is both the exterior and interior in this example. And then lastly, the property's history and its significance. Once DHR has, uh, has, has shepherded you through creating a PIF that's good for, for submittal, um, it goes to what's called the evaluation team. This is a, uh, a group of DHR staff members representing the various disciplines within uh, DHR. And they meet together to review the PIF and they use this scorecard um, on, your right, on the right hand side to then start to score the PIF for the various different uh, items that they're looking at and how well those items are represented by your particular historic resource. Um, I, I will uh, point out that there are the criterion, criteria that the National Register uh, uh, um, provides or uh, has for um, a re, uh, that, that um, you have to uh, uh, comply, you have to qualify for at least one of those criterions uh, to get on a National Register. Elizabeth already talked about this. I'm going to cover it a little bit further uh, in a while. Uh, once this uh, scorecard is completed, if it gets over a certain score, then at that point, it moves on to the State Review Board, which is here. Uh, the State Review Board is one of two citizen volunteer review boards uh, that uh, 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 advises DHR on public, uh, certain public programs that they operate. Um, both boards meet together at the same time quarterly. Uh, in their morning meeting, they meet together to, uh, to review and to approve any uh, nominations to the Virginia Register, um, Landmarks Register, or the Nas and the National Register. Then in the afternoon, the boards split up. The State Review Board's responsibility in the afternoon is to review the PIFs that have come in that, uh, that quarter. Um, and this is done in a public hearing uh, process that allows applicants and consultants and the public to, and any other public members to participate. Um, and this is the opportunity for the uh, State Review Board members to review, ask questions of the PIF from staff, the applicants, um, and also to provide advice on how they think the uh, PIF uh, could be strengthened uh, during the nomination uh, process. Um, so once this uh, review is done for each PIF, a vote is taken on whether or not the PIF is good to proceed to nomination. And once that happens, then there's a little bit of a celebration. Um, the PIF approval in itself um, has important implications. It, uh, it means that the property is eligible for the National Register, and that's sufficient for rehabilitation investment tax credits um, and participating in that program. Uh, it's all also a, uh, provides uh, some possible protection uh, to, uh, uh, if threatened by any federal or state funded uh, projects. Um, and this is through the 106 review process. So moving on to the National Register nomination form, um, you go back to the website, um, and I have uh, asked that information for this website be put in the chat to the participants of this webinar. Um, 
the and then you uh, go to step two. And once again, the guidelines are uh, provided for for uh, showing you the way step by step through the process of going through a uh, nomination for the National Register. Um, and it provides the necessary links to documents and guidelines to, to be helpful. The National Register nomination form is far more difficult than the PIF form. Uh, you see on the left-hand side, just a, the list of the items that are required in this 12-page uh, 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 nomination form. Uh, the items highlighted in red uh, will take the most time, require the most work, uh, and are extremely important in um, moving along the nomination. The so what the, so a question will come up, of course, whether or not the applicant can themselves uh, provide the nomination form, can prepare the nomination form, uh, or if a consultant will be needed. For the PIFs, uh, uh, consultants are not necessary for the PIFs. Uh, applicants can do those uh, on their own, and we get many um, done by the applicants themselves. Many of these uh, PIFs we see are, are handwritten, so uh, they're very, very straightforward. They just need the guidance of the uh, the, the the landmarks. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 state uh, staff to to help you. Uh, DHR staff, but the, the National Register nominations, they are far more difficult. Um, they have, uh, they're very complex. They require familiarity with the terminology and standardized methods for translating physical form into written narratives. Um, so uh, consultants, private consultants are available for doing uh, National Register nominations. Um, I've been asking around some, and uh, I've uh, been finding out that typical fees for doing a National Register nomination vary for the simple single properties from $5,000 to $9,000, but they can go over $12,000 for a large, complicated uh, property that has many uh, contributing resources uh, that need description also. Uh, in the link or in the information sent to you through chat, I've provided a link for the consultant's directory where uh, uh, folks wanting to uh, uh, look for a consultant, uh, they can consult that directory. And of course, in the last program in this series is going to be talking about that directly. Uh, the to be listed on the National Register, a property must demonstrate significance in one or more of the National Register criteria. And these are the four criteria. The, uh, as Elizabeth uh, uh, explained, uh, A is for uh, events uh, that um, have made a contribution uh, to our uh, cultural heritage. B, uh, properties that are associated with a, an important, a significant person in our past. Uh, C, generally uh, covers the architectural distinctive uh, project properties. Um, also, they cover uh, distinctive construction techniques, uh, as well as uh, the work of a master contractor or architect. Uh, and then lastly, D, uh, this is for properties that have, that will, and are likely to yield uh, information uh, on, uh, in prehistory or history, and mostly these are properties that are archaeological. And so I'm, I'm going to show a few examples of the various criteria, criteria A, the criterion A is uh, associated with events um, that made a, a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history. And I, I find this to be the, the, the richest uh, 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 criterion uh, in that it touches every aspect of our cultural history. There are uh, 
about 30 different um, area areas of significance listed in the, the National uh, Park Service guidelines that um, uh, are possible. And, and then they allow um, uh, through the he heading other, any others that you can think of. Um, so you see here, just in three, these three examples, they go from social welfare, communications, uh, religion and African-American heritage um, to uh, a, a diverse group of uh, hospitality industry in Virginia Beach, the Rosenwald schools uh, for education and African-American history, and then industry. Um, the building, uh, a ice cold storage building in Norfolk. Um, the criterion B uh, for properties associated with significant people, uh, a range uh, that I uh, can demonstrate here with John from the John Fox uh, house in Wise County uh, in Big Stone Gap. Uh, John Fox, of course, was uh, an author. Uh, Maggie Walker's house in Richmond, a uh, bank president, uh, and then the Langhorn house in Danville, uh, the birthplace of Lady Astor and the Gibson girl. Uh, under criterion C uh, for distinctive architecture, construction techniques, or the work of a master, um, these are three examples that show the range that uh, is covered uh, from the mountain home in Warren County, which is an, a, a, a wonderful example of the Greek revival style of architecture. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Pope Leahy House in Fairfax County. And then um, the, the Timothy Hill House in Accomack County uh, represents a really unique uh, method of construction with log planks. And then D, of course, um, for archaeological resources, uh, every, and, and this demonstrates the range of even those archaeological resources from prehistoric archaeology uh, to historic and archaeology associated with uh, prominent people uh, here in Maccamee. Um, in Accomack County, and uh, then sites that have both prehistoric and historic archaeology. Here's what I wanted. So the National Register form, of course, has many other items that are required. I've just touched on uh, uh, the, the, some major ones, um, but determinations need to be made whether the resource is local, statewide, or of national significance. Uh, the number of resources uh, are important to document and whether or not they're contributing uh, to the historic character and significance of the site uh, or not. Um, an integrity analysis needs to be done, uh, needs to be provided uh, that shows how the site and buildings still retain uh, significant integrity of, of the period of significance for them. Um, criteria considerations, these are normally uh, items that would disqualify a, a property from being on the register or being listed. Um, but there actually are uh, exceptions allowed. And uh, the, this is further explained, of course, in the guidelines and the information provided by the National Park Service. Um, but for all of these uh, criteria considerations, exceptions can be made uh, for those properties that qualify for the uh, uh, for having those exceptions allowed. And then lastly, the period of significance is extremely important to, to identify. Um, once DHR staff has approved a draft nomination, it'll be submitted to the two DHR boards um, for approval at one of their quarterly meetings. Um, this, these meetings are public hearings. The boards receive 
uh, the boards do receive drafts of the National Register nominations ahead of time. The board members are given the opportunity to ask questions of staff, to uh, uh, make comments, uh, and to, uh, uh, to, to express any concerns they might have uh, in regard to the nominations. Uh, but normally by the time it reaches the uh, actual meeting, the nominations have been scrubbed and are very well prepared and are um, uh, more often than not approved during this meeting. Um, once approved, they are the, the, the nominations, the properties that represented by the nominations are placed on the Virginia Landmarks Register immediately. Uh, and then uh, the nominations are sent to the National Park Service for them to review and to approve and eventually get on the National Register of Historic Places. Once that happens, then it's time to celebrate. Uh, and I cannot think of a better way, a more appropriate way to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Harris for the next discussion. Jerry, thank you very much. Hopefully everyone can hear me still. So my name is yes. Jeffrey Harris. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Harris. I'm better known in the preservation world by my nickname of Free. A uh, quick story there. There is another Jeffrey Allen Harris who works in historic preservation, who also worked at the National Trust for Historic Preservation when I started as an intern. <laughs> so I needed a new nickname. Um, with that in mind, um, I wanted to speak to, uh, to you all about the idea related to diversity, equity, and inclusion with regard to this overarching discussion. And I wanted to begin with an anecdote from my past life when I was a direct when I was director for diversity at the National Trust. I ran a program called the Diversity Scholarship Program that brought people to the national the old the former National Preservation Conference. And uh, one day in my office, I received a phone call from a woman from the suburban Petersburg area who had a question as to whether or not she could be considered for diversity scholarship uh, because she was concerned. She explained to me that she represented the Virginia Czech and Slovak community of which I will admit at the time, this is the early 2000s, I did not know we had a significant Czech and Slovak community. So as she's telling me, you know, about this history, I was thoroughly intrigued. And of course, my answer to her was going to be, of course, you can apply for diversity scholar, you know, scholarship, because I ran that program. And absolutely, you know, with a story like that, with information that I, as an historian, was completely unfamiliar with within the Commonwealth of Virginia, I was intrigued and felt that it was a story that needed to be told and shared with the other people I was bringing together from across the country to then, you know, share that with the broader preservation community. So I tell that story in helping you understand sort of my perspective on how we should look at, in my opinion, diversity, equity, and inclusion casting as wide a net as possible so that we're doing our best to try to capture as much of our history as possible. There are things that we don't know, things that we won't know, things that we'll learn that we'll eventually learn and we need to go ahead and get that. So with that in mind, I think it's important to frame the idea when we're reviewing sort of our existing listings, we should see those as opportunities to look at ways that we could talk more about inclusion, talk more about diversity and some equity. So for example, think of, you know, Monticello. Monticello, beautiful historic place, absolutely perfectly associated with Thomas Jefferson for all of the obvious reasons. But Thomas Jefferson wasn't the only person who lived at Monticello. There are other people who lived there. There are other people who, there are people who worked that land. There are people who built those structures. We need in that instance to talk more as the site thankfully has done about those other people. What were their contributions to this historic place? And what role can we play as professionals within the preservation movement to making sure that those stories move, you know, at least not move to the forefront, but at least get told. So in thinking about that, I think that we have great opportunities in terms of looking at ways to expand our conversation about what we know in terms of our history 
and where we can find you know good opportunities to really um, improve on the existing listings on the Virginia Landmarks Register and the National Register of Historic Places. How about we review the historic sites that we have and look for this new information? There's scholarship coming every day that reveals new things that we didn't know about that have that can be of national import. So it's important that we begin the process as professionals to look for those chances to say, you know, hey, we might want to, you know, we found out this new information. Let's re let's review what we've done and let's see if we have an opportunity to expand our understanding of, of the resources that we have among our listings, because there always has been that challenge, the question of is the National Register, you know, diverse enough? Does it have a good representation across the board of the variety of histories that exist within, you know, our historical narrative? And I think that the key in that regard would be to let's let's go back and review what we what we have because there are there's so many opportunities. I know I'm being repetitive, but I really want to drive home this notion that we have, I think, in many respects, the diversity that we seek in the listings currently that we have. If we just go back and review that history, there in, there's information that's been obscured. So for example, in the work that I've done dealing with LGBTQ historic places, there are people that we know of who were a part of that community, but that wasn't discussed for various and sundry reasons, you know, prior to the current day. We can go back and reinsert that information into the historical record because we have that information, because we know that is available, and that expands what we know. There are instances where we have, you know, people who were master craftsmen who were enslaved Africans. We can go back, and if that wasn't discussed, we can reinsert that, we can insert that information into existing uh, nominations so that we are capturing better that history that actually did happen, but we may not that may have been obscured in the past. With that in mind, we then should also make sure to think about what our future listings can look like. You know, always looking for opportunities to cast as wide a net as possible so that we can be inclusive of the, you know, the variety of people that make up, you know, who we are here in Virginia and across the country. And, you know, in so doing, we need to encourage, you know, people who have that information, people who may not necessarily have spoken to those of us who are in this profession, you know, encourage them to step forward and begin the process of, of following what Jody has suggested, you know, filling out those forms and, and letting all of us know, letting the world, letting the DHR know that there are these places that exist that should be looked at for consideration. And even if something doesn't necessarily make it all the way through the process toward, you know, a, nom a full -on nomination, it still does have the opportunity of sparking greater interest for those of us who are out in the field to look, you know, further into investigating, you know, what it is that we don't know. So I go back to that Czech and Slovak history example that I'd found. Not that I personally had gone back into that, but I do know that there are people who actually, you know, upon that sort of, you know, that introduction really went further and, you know, when, you know, lo are looking for greater examples in that sense um, that they could bring forward. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. But the key thing that I always try to, to stress whenever I have an opportunity to talk is that we always have to remember that history is what brought us here in the first place. Historical scholarship changes. We find new information and it is always important for us to be on top of that as best we can so that when historic places come up that are relevant, we're ready, you know, when those people who want to, you know, hire us or when communities, you know, reach out to the professionals who are out there to say, okay, we're prepared to work with you. And that is, um, it is a difficult thing. I don't know why I'm blanking at the moment because it happened in a sense, I'm going to stop and just say, I always get excited. That's probably why I get excited about this topic because I always worry that there is this sense of 
we're not necessarily doing enough in terms of diversity. And that is true to a degree. But again, we also have to look at you know, sort of the low hanging fruit that exists all around us. We need to do a better job of mining what's, what's nearby. So for example, here in my town of Hampton, where I'm located, there is more than likely a very significant LGBTQ historic place. There is a, an airman named Leonard Matlovich, who's a Vietnam era veteran, who was very instrumental in the early efforts at uh, trying to go against the ban on, on gays serving in the military. He lived in a house that was about two miles away from where I'm sitting. And that was where he, he wrote that first letter saying, hey, I want to be able to serve. I want to be able to serve openly and I want to be able to serve you know, at the same time. Interestingly, after that letter was submitted and word got out, his home was shot at, you know, again, just two miles from where I, from where I am. And that is an interesting story to tell. It is one that I certainly wasn't aware of growing up here in Hampton, going to high school, literally a couple of blocks away from where that took place. Now, that's a sort of story in some respects that really can spark a really set of interesting, you know, spark a set of interesting questions, you know, like, well, what else is going on here locally? You know, and it can't, it doesn't just have to be LGBTQ. As was mentioned earlier, I work, you know, with regard to on a personal front, you know, music related historic places. I really want to find out more information about, you know, Virginia's music, you know, history beyond, you know, the Carters, you know, Carter country, which is, which is wonderful. But what about, um, historic places that, historic places that could be related to say the Dave Matthews band out of Charlottesville. What about other local, you know, other local bands, those sorts of things that allow us to think more widely, to cast those wider nets. And more importantly for us and the work that we do, getting more people to understand the importance of a broader preservation ethic. And by having that, we end up getting more people who support the work that we do and who get to see the benefits of the work that we do, how it impacts communities and all of the things that, you know, that you'll be learning through this academy. You know, those are the sorts of things that will help. And by having as many people, as many different people who feel as though they are a part of this broader discussion, who feel as though their history is represented in some way, shape, or form, whose history is recognized and honored, that is what helps to make sure that we can continue doing what we're doing going forward. So with all of that in mind, I hope that's somewhat helpful. It's fairly brief, but I want us to get to the Q&A. And with that in mind, thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time. And I want to send it back to Ms. Keller. Thank you to all of our panelists for their time and their insights and their, uh, their knowledge, career long knowledge, and their, also their service uh, to the professions and, and also to the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, for their voluntary service on uh, the, the boards and, uh, and for Elizabeth, her career and, <clears throat> and, and current work at, at DHR. But we have, uh, a number of questions, and some of these have been answered in the chat, but I'm sure other people have been trying to take notes and, and, and get their planning credits and concentrating on the speakers as they should. So I think, I think we should give these at least a brief consideration uh, verbally so that uh, everybody can benefit from them. Um, and there's a question about um, how can we find a list of uh, themes for Virginia uh, can we, and how can people suggest a theme, for example, roadside motels? And I'm gonna pitch that back to Elizabeth who's already answered that. Sure, so DHR has a list of our multiple property document themes on our website. Um, so you can lose, use the URL that I listed in the answer to that question, or if you go to the DHR website and then just hit our search button and type in multiple property documents, 
it will pull up the complete list and it goes on for three screens. So make sure to scroll through them all. There are a lot of really interesting MPDs that have been written. And I, I, MPDs are one of my favorite National Register documents because they're so interesting. And, you know, they provide such a service for property owners because they allow property owners to, you know, write such shorter nominations and, and have to do, you know, just so much less work than they would if they had to do all of that background research themselves. So they really make it a lot easier for property owners to get, to, you know, to fill out that nomination form and make it a little more quickly through the process. Plus, they're just really interesting to read. If you want to read a great history of Rosenwald schools in Virginia, go to that MPD and you'll just read a fascinating history about Rosenwald schools. Thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, we also have a question about local registers. We've talked about state and national ones. Um, and I, I'm going to pitch this first to, to Jody and then ask uh, Elizabeth to do wrap up. Uh, Jody had some ideas on Albemarle County's local register. This, this came from a, a question about Loudoun County, which of course has a number of listings, uh, state and nationally, but not a, not a local. Uh, register and that's something that they're that they're interested in. So Jody, do you, do you want to? Sure, Al Albemarle County uh, has such a program. Um, I know that um, for th that consultation needs to occur between the county and uh, D DHR um, because there is a requirement that any local plaques uh, need to be visually different from the state uh, highway markers. Um, so that, that's usually a, 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 can be a, a easily coordinated with uh, the Department of Historic Resources. Um, but Albemarle County, uh, they have a program. Uh, they are uh, marking uh, some of their significant properties such as the training school, um, at Union Ridge, uh, that was a Rosenwald uh, uh, training school. Uh, they're also looking to put up a plaque for a teacher, Virginia Murray, uh, at St. John's uh, Rosenwald School. Uh, she was a significant person. Um, so uh, th th this is handled through the uh, Historic Preservation Committee for Albemarle County. And I put that link uh, in the chat. Thanks, Jody. Would, would you like to elaborate on that a little bit, Elizabeth, and, and possibly uh, the, the requirement that, the, that any kind of a marker program locally be differentiated from, uh, from the state one? Because that's something I wasn't even aware of until a couple of years ago, that, that there was such a requirement. Right. So we don't want any confusion between the state marker system and any local marker systems. So oftentimes, they're different in shape or size or color. Um, you know, you'll see uh, this, you know, the state roadside markers are pretty distinctive. They've got that big square shape with the little point on the bottom, I think. Well, I think it's been a whole three hours since I saw a marker and they're gone from my mind. Um, but they're that silver color and they're pretty distinctive. And so, you know, we want things that aren't going to be confused with the state highway markers. Um, one of the other local programs that I would recommend looking at as well is Historic Alexandria. Um, so you can go to historicalexandriafoundation.org. Um, they have a local listing program that includes archaeological and above ground resources. Um, you know, it's a pretty robust, it's a very robust program. And they also have a local ordinance overlay that helps protect those resources. So whether it's in the National Register, the state listing, or, you know, the local listing, um, Alexandria is, is pretty... Um, uh, pretty strong about protecting their historic resources. So I would look at that model. That's an excellent one as well. Thanks, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, there's also, a there are a couple of questions about moving buildings on property and uh, what that might do to its eligibility and uh, could it be moved on, on its own site or and how far? Is, is that one you would like, like to address? Jody, do you want to take that one on? I know we've had several on the state review that moved. It's problematic always. Yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> uh, 
The, the important thing is to consult with the staff at the Department of Historic Resources before you move it. Um, recently, uh, it was uh, uh, working with the um, the owners uh, at, uh, for a small school in southeastern Virginia. I forget exactly where it was, where it is, um, but. Uh, that was uh, submitted. The Restate Review Board reviewed it with the staff. Um, and the considerations are that when it, once it's moved, we need to make sure that it's being moved to a site that uh, Matt, or comes very close to replicating the site that it was on. Um, and that's very important. Um, and also, uh, uh, how many pieces it's uh, taken apart in, um, that's extremely important. So there, there, there's a lot to be considered. It can be done. It's, um, it's unusual, but it can be done. And it requires the consultation and approval of the Department of Historic Resources before it's done um, so that they can approve the process and approve its eventual relocation, um, and 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 just that, and then they'll they'll uh, you know I, uh, uh, assure the owners that it will remain listed as a result after being moved. Thanks, Jody. Um, there's also some uh, a question about the distinction between a national register listing and a national historic landmark listing. And I wonder if you could go into a little more detail about that and uh, the steps that, that would be required to uh, become an NHL and what the advantages or benefits might be to doing that. I can, I can talk a little bit about that, but I don't normally work with NHLs, um, except the discussion I had today earlier about where I'm Comico. Uh, but the National Register listing, you can be significant at a local, state, or national level in order to be placed on the National Register. Um, you know, your significance can, can be at any of those meet any of those three different um, levels of importance. For the National Historic Landmarks, um, you must be significant at the national level and it must play an important role in American history. Um, and I know that's a, a much longer nomination process and much more involved, uh, but I don't think we normally get, uh, we don't normally do too much with those. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of experience with how different the forms are and how much more complex it is. I just know it is a whole lot more complex. Okay. And, and can you refer them to uh, a person at, at DHR who works more with, with the NHL program? Probably Lena McDonald, who also leads our register program. And the National Park Service has a good deal of information on the NHL program as well. Thank you. You're uh, the, the next, uh, would you like to add anything, Jody, or Free? No, not for me. Elizabeth knows more about it than I do. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna stay in my lane in that regard. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the, the next question is one that, that I was going to ask, so I'm glad it's here in the, uh, the Q&A that have been written. What are some con key considerations that you recommend making when revising existing National Register nominations, uh, particularly districts, to be more inclusive of history that may have been obscured when they were written in the past? Do you wanna take that free? Well, no, uh, as a, as a academic historian and, a, and usually I'm hired as a research historian to do that, to actually look at some of that sort of work. Um, it usually, you know, for me, it's, got, it's going back into the scholarship, making sure that, you know, if anything has been um, found in terms of primary source material, so meaning sort of first person, uh, you know, accounts or contemporary of the period accounts, if that information that had, say, been obscured, say, um, something that had been written in a diary, or say, in the case of a plantation, some plantation paper information, you know, that to bring that sort of information into the fore and then look at revising the historic statement, you know, within the nomination so that, 
you know, then resubmitting that so that you then can, you know, begin the process of looking at what are some other areas, what's some other criteria that you can look at possibly to add to that particular listing that may have been missing before. So the, in that regard, I've definitely come across some information that, you know, oh, look, this has been there all along. <laughs> and they just decided not to use that. So we're gonna go ahead and put that in. <laughs> now we're gonna go ahead and, and make sure that that particular story is told or that or those particular people are, are uplifted and, and added into the historical record of that particular, of a particular site. I think we probably just need to be very frank and acknowledge uh, that because Virginia has such a long list and had so many properties that were placed on, sort of instantly placed on, on the register as, as Elizabeth said, very early on in the late 1960s, that we have a number of nominations that need to be revisited uh, that may have significance in a, in a different uh, realm today because of our, our current sensitivities than, than they had in the, in the late 1960s. Uh, because we put on so many presidential home sites and homes of the, of the founding fathers, which is not to say that they're not significant today, but we might even be reevaluating the ways they were significant and maybe go to what uh, Jody was talking about as his favorite criterion being criterion A. How did they contribute to the broad events and trends of our history that we uh, are struggling or glorifying or re-examining in our, in our own time? Uh, when I was prepping for my class a couple of weeks ago, I, I came across a, a, a discussion by a Harvard psychologist, uh, Daniel Schachter, who said, there's a very long tradition in memory research of how what we remember about the past not only reflects what happened, but our own current needs. And I think many of us are reaching back into the past to explain our very complicated present. And it would seem that this is a way that national and state registers and lo local registers and other types of interpretation might help us deal with, with our present by re-examining the past. And I'm, I'm seeing that as a kind of question that, that many people are, are struggling, struggling with. And, and, and we certainly uh, can do that here in, in Virginia. Well, and I just to quickly add, um, it's not a Virginia example, it's a South Carolina example, but Drayton Hall proved to be a bit of a revelation to me when I visited because of course the, the 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 main house itself is basically you know it's about architecture and what i did not know was that you could see the work of a master craftsman whom i believe they believed to have been a european but there was also an enslaved african apprentice who once that european craftsman was gone <laughs> was able was trained to be able to maintain the architectural features and structures of said site. So even, even there in a, in a category that some people would often argue, well, what's the relevance of say an enslaved African there? Well, if you know anything about enslaved Africans and the work they had to do, that was a part of the work they had to do. So therefore, we need to start looking in terms of the building arts. How do they fit in there? How do we go back and, you know, that's again, reviewing say plantation records and looking at the actual jobs that individual enslaved Africans may have had. You know, who are the master craftsmen? You know, so even, even within sort of that, sort of the, the more stolid architectural realm, you still have opportunities to get that inclusion and that historical equity in, you know, from people who actually did the work. And it doesn't, it doesn't change the beauty of a site or the craftsmanship of a place, it just gives ownership to the people who may have done that work. It's really acknowledging that that role that has long been excluded and, and ignored. How many nominations have we all read that say, Mr. Great White Man built this house? Well, chances are he did not build it with his own hands that other people did. And so at Criterion D, we acknowledge craftsmanship and workmanship and materials. And there may be a thumbprint in a, in a brick that kind of evidence that, that these are handmade items. And, and those are the kinds of values that we can maybe repair, repair these nominations 
uh, moving forward. I know in my in my own field, my my sort of niche in all of this being the cultural landscape. So many of those early nominations don't don't talk about the the acreage and and how a how a farm or a plantation developed or how the the spatial layout of of towns those characteristics that are also very important but originally we were very building focused and so we we have a, a lot of opportunity uh to to go back and re revisit those those nominations and and to, to make them more inclusive of the way people have have really lived and worked uh in virginia and so i wonder elizabeth if you could talk a little bit about the Community Outreach Coordination Initiative that DHR has, I think that would be of interest to people. Sure, so we have uh, a staff person, Tim Roberts, who is actually here tonight with us as uh, in, the, in the attendees, um, who is um, our outreach coordinator and he works to um, expand the representation of African-Americans and Virginia Indians in all of our programs. And so he works with those communities, um, with community engagement and representation uh, to make sure that our work uh, has more, more voices that are represented in those histories and in those resources than have been in the past. Um, so if you would like to talk to Tim and, and um, get in touch with him, his email and his phone number are in both the chat and in the question and answers. Um, so you can reach him um, through there. So he's working with properties that are not necessarily listed at this point, and they might not be eligible, but you know we need to do a lot more background research in order to determine that. So um, feel free to reach out to Tim and talk to him about these issues. Thanks, Elizabeth. Do, do any of you panelists have questions or comments for each other before I hand this back to Elizabeth uh, Castellni to wrap up? I'll, I'll go out on the limb only because uh, I'm, I, I just find it, it was very eye-opening to me. Um, I recently read a a, a document called Powerful Artifacts, a guide to surveying and documenting rural African-American churches in the South. And it was put out by the Middle Tennessee State University. And it really, it, it taught me a different way of looking at uh, rural African-American churches and understanding their history and how their history is so wrapped up with their, 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 challenges from the, the, the white supremacists um, that surrounded them. Um, and, and that when they were able to, to work on their churches and have money to, to, uh, to put into their churches, um, it, was, it was when the, you know, they were gaining civil rights um, or after emancipation. Um, and it's, it, so it just caused me to to uh, realize that there's a whole different way of looking at certain resources, depending upon um, uh, their history and and uh, their their well, just that. Um, and I and obviously that's <laughs> that sounds rather naive, but um, you know it's it's not the way that I have normally uh, reviewed and looked at uh, the history of church building in the United States. Um, it, it's a very different way of seeing it and, and starting to appreciate the kind of difficulties that were experienced in um, creating their churches, African-Americans. Thanks so much, Jody. And I would like to thank all of you for your attention and for registering for this webinar. Please stay in touch with us at Preservation Virginia. And I'm going to hand this back to Elizabeth Castelli because I'm losing my voice. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you to Elizabeth Moore, uh, Free, Jody, Jenny, and especially to Sonia for organizing tonight's event. And my thanks to all of you that have tuned in as well. Um, I think we've learned a lot about the registers, the state and the national registers and the resources that are available at DHR. And if there's one takeaway, I hope, well, actually it's two. 
One, there's a rich website at the Department of Historic Resources that should be your first stop as you um, in, contemplate um, the opportunities of submitting a PIF. And second, behind that website, there's a group of dedicated professionals that are ready and willing to sort of answer your questions and help you through that process. So we appreciate y'all's attendance tonight. Um, we hope that you will sign up for the next session, which is on March 30th, that really will get down to sort of the nuts and bolts of how to research a historic property and tips on preparing a register nomination. And until then, we hope that you have, are enjoying this beautiful spring, almost spring weather, and you get out and you visit some historic places. So take care and we'll see you next time.